Well, good evening, and thank you uh, for coming. Uh, well, before I begin, I just want to first thank Mr. Havlis and everyone here at the Historical Center uh, for allowing me to come here to do this presentation. Um, you know, our community really benefits from having a facility such as this to hold events like this and the uh, events that Mr. Havlis was just mentioning. And uh, I remember a couple, a couple years ago, I don't know, was it 2000, uh, 2012 or 2013 you came to the council and you were talking about the, the 2012, that, all right, I thought it was 2012, and just talking about the vision uh, for this facility, and, and I instantly raised my hand. I said, well, uh, sign me up. I will, I will be here for, uh, for an event, anything I can do, and uh, well, here I am tonight, and, uh, and such a fitting um, occasion uh, as it is the 150th anniversary of this tragedy uh, um, that, I mean, I don't think our country ever really recovered from it very much like the Kennedy assassination that we just had the 50th anniversary of uh, in 2013. So I hope uh, at the end of this uh, event that you have, you walk out with a bit more understanding of the events surrounding this, um, this murder, this again, uh, national tragedy. And I hope if you have any questions, you can feel free to ask me and I will do my best to answer them. So with that said, I will uh, begin. Um, so, to, so to understand uh, you know, the, the characters involved here, uh, it's only fitting to begin with uh, Abraham Lincoln. So Abraham Lincoln, he was born February the 12th, 1809 in uh, Hodgen, Hodgenville, Kentucky. Uh, so it's uh, East Central uh, Kentucky. Uh, he was the second child of uh, Thomas and uh, Mary Lincoln. Uh, his mother uh, died when he, uh, when he was only nine years old. And for the record, she did not die from a vampire, uh, as as uh, as it's been uh, it's been written about. Uh, there was a movie about that. So uh, for those who believe that uh, she died from a vampire and he became a vampire slayer, uh, unfortunately, that is not entire. Uh, that is not true. Uh, so um, I just want to quell that right now uh, for the record. Um, his father would remarry um, to. Uh, um, years later to a woman named uh, Sarah uh, Johnston. Uh, she would actually live to see him become president and then um, and uh, unfortunately would uh, um, live to see uh, her stepson um, being shot. Well, she wasn't there, but she, uh, she heard about it and uh, she did comment on it saying that, uh, you know, that she had feared that something dreadful would happen to him and unfortunately that did happen. Um, but over time, Lincoln would grow very distant from his father, uh, really uh, for two reasons. One, uh, Thomas's lack of education and his, you know, thinking, well, you know, working on the farm, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's the best thing for you, uh, for you. And Abraham just, that's not what he wanted to do. So uh, by the time he was 21, he, um, he set on his own. He eventually relocated to um, the new state of Illinois. Uh, to the new capital of Springfield. Uh, he would uh, be admitted to the bar. Um, and uh, he actually, uh, would, uh, as I said, would go very distant from his, uh, from his father. He actually, um, when his father was dying, he did not go to his funeral. Um, he just cut him off, wanted nothing to do with him. Um, and it was in 1842. Uh, that he would marry uh, his wife, Mary Todd. Uh, she came from a very prominent family, uh, also from Kentucky, um, the Todd family. Um, although on the second um, uh, attempt they would marry, uh, he actually, uh, as recently discovered, he actually broke off the uh, engagement and they, they got back together and they would marry. They would have four children, uh, Robert Todd, um, Edward, Willie, or Eddie, I should say, uh, Willie, and uh, Tad, the only son that would live to adulthood would be uh, uh, Robert Todd, and he would, he would live um, into his 80s. Uh, he was actually at the uh, dedication of the Lincoln Memorial in uh, 1922, so he, he, uh, he lived a very long life. He was the only son that would uh, survive. Uh, so, uh, road to the, to the White House. So, uh, it was a, a bumpy road. Uh, it, it, it wasn't a success at every uh, turn. Um, as soon as he got to Illinois, uh, he really began to get interested in uh, politics. He became a member of the Whig Party, uh, and in 1836, he was elected to the Illinois House of Representatives, actually on his second attempt. He first ran in 1832, 
um, and he didn't win. Uh, he lost uh, narrowly, I believe. Um, but he did run again. He got elected uh, the, on the second try, and he would serve until uh, 1842 or 1843. Uh, a couple years later, in uh, uh, 1846, he ran uh, for the United States uh, House of Representatives. Uh, he served one term as a prearranged uh, deal. Uh, and good thing he didn't run for re-election because he, he would have been defeated because uh, the Democrat uh, won the uh, election in 1848. Uh, Lincoln's uh, only real known contribution during his time in Congress was uh, his introduction of the spot resolution. And at that time, uh, the United States and Mexico were at war uh, over uh, Texas and California and the, um, what became Arizona and New Mexico. And the Whig Party, which Lincoln was a member of, was opposed to the war. And so when he got to Congress, he introduced a sp uh, what, he, what is called the spot resolution. He basically challenged uh, President James Polk about the exact location as to where the war started. Was it American territory? Was it Mexican territory? Uh, and of course, like, uh, like uh, what goes on today in politics, uh, um, the president typically uh, will ignore um, what Congress says, and the president uh, never responded to, uh, to Lincoln. Um, so he goes back to Illinois uh, after a failed attempt at getting a job in the new uh, Zachary Taylor administration. So for the next uh, six years or so, so from 1849 to 1854, he's back in Illinois. Uh, he's traveling the circuit as a lawyer, but he's still following national politics. And it was in 1854 that Lincoln re-engaged in the national discussion. And that was over the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska uh, Nebraska Act. Uh, and what that was, real briefly, uh, it was a law uh, proposed by Stephen Douglas, who I'll get to in a, in a momentarily, um, which basically said uh, if you lived in the, in the territories of Kansas and Nebraska, you can vote, it was called popular so sovereignty, whether or not to have slavery. And it was a repeal of the old Missouri Compromise, which had basically kept the country at peace for about 30 years. And as a response, um, the country, particularly in the north, here in New England as well, exploded in rage, um, and Lincoln got back into politics. Uh, he made his first attempt at the United States Senate. He almost got elected. He, he failed. He lost by just a couple votes. Um, so he decided to wait until 1858. And by that time, there was a new political party, the Republican Party, which still exists today, as we all know. Uh, and in 1858, he accepted the Republican nomination for uh, the Senate seat uh, in Illinois. Uh, and that's when he gave his famous a House Divided Against Itself speech, you know, the House Cannot Stand. Um, he would, uh, he would challenge Douglas to a series of debates. It's what became known as the Lincoln-Douglas debates. There was a series of seven throughout Illinois. And uh, Lincoln, again, almost got elected. Uh, but the only problem was, back at that time, um, senators were not directly elected by the people. They were elected by the state legislatures. Um, and since the Democrats had a majority in the uh, Illinois legislature, Stephen Douglas got reelected. But one good thing came out of that. And that was that the Lincoln-Douglas debates had been published. So for those in the East, particularly here again in New England and the other Eastern states that were, weren't really familiar with Abraham Lincoln, his name really got talked about as potentially a candidate for president in 1860. So in 1860, Lincoln, uh, in, the, in the second tier of candidates, runs for the Republican nomination for president. And uh, the front runner at that time was a man named William Seward. He was he had been a former governor of New York. He was uh, he was in the United States Senate, uh, and he was a very outspoken critic uh, of slavery. But that was that was the one problem with with his candidacy. He was too anti-slavery, and very much again like like our system today. If you want to have a chance at winning an election, you have to be more you have to be more of a moderate, so you can appeal to to both sides, and uh, and. And that's how Lincoln was viewed uh, as more of a moderate. So he won on the third ballot. He uh, won the uh, Republican nomination. And uh, the, Democratic, uh, the Democrats were very divided in 1860. Uh, the, uh, they, uh, what ended up happening, the party split. Um, 
between North and South. So the Northern branch nominated Stephen Douglas and the Southern branch of the Democratic Party nominated the incumbent Vice President John C. Breckinridge. And Mr. Breckinridge would become a, a general and Secretary of War for the Confederacy later on. So he did not go out too well. Um, and there was actually a fourth party uh, called the uh, um, Constitutional Party uh, and their platform was just follow the Constitution. That was it. Uh, and so the result was Abraham Lincoln would be elected president as the 16th president in November of 1860. And right away, um, or not too long after, Lincoln appoints um, William Seward to be Secretary of State. And I will get back to uh, Secretary Seward uh, later on. So right away, almost within days of Lincoln's election, uh, the, the South, uh, is an outrage, and he did not get a single vote, by the way, in the South. His name was not on the ballot in 11 states. Um, so South Carolina, which was really the hotbed for uh, secession, um, called a convention together, and on December 20th of 1860, South Carolina became the first state to secede. Uh, and by the time of Lincoln's inauguration, six others would follow, and by then they would form the Confederate uh, States of America. Um, and on February 11th, so a couple months later, um, Lincoln uh, sets out from Springfield to go to, to, go to Washington to uh, get sworn in. Uh, and en route, uh, it's discovered that there was a plot to assassinate him. Um, um, now, before and after the election, um, Lincoln, uh, well, before the election, I should say, Lincoln uh, began getting uh, death threats. And this would be ongoing throughout his time in the White House. Um, he actually, uh, and, and I, when, I, when I found this out, I was astonished. He actually had a, 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 a file, a special file in the White House, in his desk, just for death threats. So when he would get a death threat, he would just put it in that one file and would put it away. As, as ridiculous as that sounds, he actually did that. Um, so, so even, even before his election, he, he, he got death threats. Um, so again, on February, February 11th, he, would, he left Springfield to, um, to, go to, to go to Washington to get sworn in. And on, and on the way, um, it's discovered that there was a plot uh, to assassinate him when he passed through Baltimore. Um, Baltimore at that time was very, uh, very pro-secession. Uh, in fact, Maryland was a very divided state. So if you lived in western Maryland, uh, it was more pro-Union, but if you lived in Baltimore in the eastern half of the state, it was more pro-Confederate. Um, so, uh, so it was organized by a group called the National Volunteers, and the organizer of this group was originally a supporter of John C. Breckinridge. Um, but the plot was foiled by uh, Alan Pickerton and his uh, security um, um, organization. And so, um, so Lincoln decided to change his plans um, to go through Baltimore. He just bypassed it. Um, he, got, he got criticized for it. Unfortunately, I didn't have time. Uh, there was a, a famous um, uh, cart uh, cartoon ad um, of him peeking out of a train. Um, you know, it, it, it was not a good moment for, for Lincoln. He got criticized for that. Um, but he, he did, make, he did uh, reach Washington safely, and on March 4th, 1861, he was sworn in as President of the United States. And within a few short weeks, the Civil War began on April 12th, 1861, when, when Confederate forces uh, in, Char at, in Charleston Harbor, South Carolina, opened fire on Fort Sumter. So the Civil War began. Now, unfortunately, I wish I could do more of a talk on the Civil War. I would love to do that, uh, perhaps for a future event. But, uh, but for this occasion, uh, I'm going to just shorten it real quick. Uh, so the Civil War obviously was the big highlight of his um, four-plus four years uh, as president. Um, between 620 and 750,000 were killed. Um, the 750,000 number, um, recent research has suggested that the number um, was quite higher than the accepted number, which has been 620,000. So I decided to, um, to include that. Um, so other highlights of uh, the Lincoln presidency, um, the, the first big one was the Trent Affair. The Trent Affair is really, I think, one of the most unforgotten or less known parts of the Civil War. It involved uh, the, um, a British steam uh, a mail ship, um, the Trent, and on board uh, were two Confederate diplomats uh, one going to England and one going to France. And it was seized by an American naval ship without authorization. 
Um, the Confederates were taken back uh, to the, actually to Boston. Uh, and of course the North was excited, uh, but the British were not happy with us. And it almost led to war with Great Britain. And had that happened, it's very likely that one, one the French would have sided with the British. And it's very likely that um, we would have lost the Civil War. In fact, the British actually sent troops to Canada. But fortunately, um, Lincoln diffused the crisis. They were released, and the British backed off. Um, we should be very grateful to them. Um, some other high um, uh, highlights. Uh, the Battle of Antietam uh, was, the single, was the bloodiest day in American history. Um, uh, let's see. Um, altogether, 22,000 casualties um, wounded, over 3,000 were killed. That was more, it was worse than, uh, than D-Day at Omaha Beach. Um, and, and, I mean, every time I read that statistic, it's, it, it, sends shield, uh, it just gives me chills. Um, five days later, the Emancipation Proclamation was, was announced, um, which said that after January 1st of 1863, all, all slaves in the states still in rebellion would be henceforth forever free. Uh, the Battle of Gettysburg happened a few months, um, the, pre the next summer. Um, after three days of fighting, uh, there were over 50,000 uh, casualties, and in fact, the picture at the bottom uh, was from uh, Gettysburg. Uh, the New York City draft riots, um, about a week and a half later in New York City, that was in response to the, um, the new draft law, uh, and uh, it did not go over very well. And, and also, I, I should mention, the Emancipation Proclamation was not w received by everybody in the North. Uh, and, and so that was also a, 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 a response or a reason that the draft riots occurred. And over 100 uh, people were, were killed uh, in those uh, few days in uh, New York City. Uh, the 13th Amendment would be passed in uh, January of 1865. We just had the 150th anniversary of that um, a couple months ago. And some important legislation, um, the biggest one was the Homestead Act. <laughs> Excuse me. And what that law uh, did, um, it basically gave free land to settlers who were moving to the West. Uh, that's the shortest summary of that I could give you. Um, there were some other pieces of, of legislation, but I felt this one was probably the most important one to include for, uh, for tonight. So, 18, uh, so 1864, um, Lincoln is renominated by the Republicans, or the, the, uh, they've rebranded, rebranded themselves the uh, Union Party. Um, the incumbent vice president was Hannibal Hamlin uh, from Maine, but he was dropped from the ticket, and in his place was uh, Andrew Johnson, who was from Tennessee. Uh, Andrew Johnson had been uh, a United States senator from Tennessee. When Tennessee seceded, he did not go with his state. He was the only Southerner who stayed in Congress um, during, uh, during the war, and Lincoln would um, reward him for that by naming him the military governor of Tennessee. So he was nominated for vice president in 1864 to show national unity. The only problem was, and unlike today, uh, if you're a, a presidential nominee, you have assets like the FBI, you have other people to vet your candidates. That didn't exist in 1864, and um, had that been available, uh, I don't think Andrew Johnson would have been uh, picked for vice president. And as it turned out, as it would turn out, his uh, being picked would have catastrophic consequences for the country. Um, so, and on the bottom, you can see um, the uh, the other side. Uh, the Democrats nominated General George McClellan, who had been uh, a pain in the neck to uh, Lincoln during the war. Um, the Democratic platform actually called for an end to to hostilities, and McClellan was. Like, I don't really want to be a part of that. But he eventually um, agreed to the platform. Um, and, during, and, 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 and during that particular summer, the war was not going very well for the North. And it looked very likely that Lincoln would be uh, defeated. He actually uh, wrote a letter. Um, and, and he did not, and as the story goes, he did not tell his cabinet what it, what it said. He just said, please sign this. And as it turned out, um, after the election, it said that um, it was probable that it, that the administration would be reelected if that were the case, that um, they basically agreed to cooperate with the new president to basically win the war before he got sworn in. Um, that did not happen. But things turned around for Lincoln uh, on September 1st when Atlanta fell to, uh, to General William Tecumseh Sherman. 
and that November Lincoln was reelected. So on March 4th, 1865, uh, Lincoln was sworn in for his second term. And uh, of course, this particular uh, paragraph uh, I, and if, uh, is obviously very well known today. Um, he said, with malice towards none, with charity for all, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. And also on that inauguration day, uh, as an invited guest, uh, was John Wilkes Booth and his co-conspirator, Louis Powell. Um, now, I don't know uh, if, uh, does, does, this, does the, the light work? Uh, um, which, I'm sorry, which button? I didn't ask before, which button is it? Okay, well, well, uh, well, let's, uh, Let's see. Okay, well, forget it. Um, it it's kind of hard to see, but if you were to look um, about the middle of the picture, down below, you'll see um, a man with, with a white hat. That is actually um, Lewis Powell. And um, again, I wish I had the, 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 the scanner uh, to, to show you, but John Wilkes Booth is up there uh, in, uh, in that crowd um, on that inauguration day. And this is where I'm going to lead into introducing you to John Wilkes Booth. So John Wilkes Booth, he was born May the 10th, 1838, in the, the town of Bel Air, uh, Maryland. Uh, his parents, uh, Junius Brutus Booth uh, and Mary Ann Holmes, both had immigrated from uh, England to the United States in the 1820s. Uh, he had, he had um, uh, his, his brother uh, Edwin, who, who supported the, the North during the war. Uh, they did not get along as a result of that. Um, his uh, brothers uh, Junius uh, and his sister uh, Asia. So Booth uh, made his stage debut um, on August uh, 14th of 1855. Uh, he was only 17 uh, years old. He played the role of the Earl of Richmond in uh, Richard III. Um, and as, as the country was dividing over slavery, um, and again, as I said before, Maryland was very divided between um, pro-Union, pro pro-Confederate, um, Booth would identify with, um, with the South. And he would, in fact, volunteer with the, um, uh, the Richmond Grays in 1859. And he was there uh, at the, uh, the execution of John Brown, who tried to uh, begin a, a rebellion by seizing Harper's Ferry. That did not succeed. Um, so actually, Booth was there when he was uh, executed. Um, he initially opposed secession, but he would embrace it uh, over time. Um, he never joined the Confederate Army for two reasons. One, uh, he promised his mother he would not join. And second, he did not like the sight of blood. So uh, those are two good reasons uh, not, to, uh, not to go into the, uh, uh, into the Army. Um, and during the war, so during the war, he would continue um, uh, being on, on stage. And his last paid performance was on May the 28th of 1864. Uh, so his views on slavery and on Abraham Lincoln. Um, as I said, he was a very staunch supporter of slavery, whereas his brother uh, was, was a, a big Lincoln supporter, and obviously he was for uh, the Union. Um, again, his brother uh, John was very much against that. Um, so I wanted to give you, uh, give you uh, uh, two examples of his position on slavery. Uh, he wrote in uh, December of 1860, uh, quote, the South has a, has a right, according to the Constitution, to keep and hold slaves, and we have no right under that Constitution to interfere with her or her slaves. And he would write four years later that this country was formed for the white, not for the black man. Uh, and by 1864, uh, as the Confederacy was losing ground to uh, General, uh, General Grant's um, army, as well as uh, General Sherman, uh, this is when Booth first began to come up with his kidnapping plot. This was his first attempt uh, to go against Abraham Lincoln. So by late 1864, um, again, as, as the Confederacy is losing ground, uh, Booth forms a plot to kidnap uh, Lincoln. And his idea was, well, if I can kidnap Abraham Lincoln, I will take him to Richmond and we will do a prisoner exchange. Uh, we'll, I'll give you Lincoln back and you give us our prisoners. Uh, as, and again, as ridiculous as that sounds, uh, that was his, uh, his intention. So he recruits uh, for this kidnapping plot um, uh, a group of conspirators, 
uh, including his childhood friends uh, Samuel Arnold and Michael O'Loughlin. Um, over time, that would expand to include others, um, in, in, including David Harold, George Atzerodt, Lewis, pa uh, Lewis Powell, and John Surratt, who was also a childhood uh, friend. Um, the conspirators would gather at a boarding house owned by John Surratt's mother, Mary, Mary Surratt, uh, in, uh, in Charles County, Maryland. Again, this is the part of Maryland where it was very pro-Confederate, and this was the, really the, the, the center of the Confederate underground at that time. Uh, so within days of Lincoln's second inauguration, uh, Booth attempts his kidnapping plot. Um, so the plan was to seize Abraham Lincoln um, on his way uh, to the Campbell uh, Military um, Hospital, um, although it says theater up there, it should say hospital, um, uh, where he was going to, uh, to watch a performance uh, with, uh, with the troops. Um, but Lincoln cancels the visit, for what reason we don't know. Um, so Booth uh, missed that first uh, attempt at Lincoln. And so, so these are uh, four of the conspirators that, um, uh, that I'll focus mostly on. Uh, on the top left is Lewis Powell, um, who uh, would be, in, uh, I'll speak about him uh, in depth uh, in a few minutes. Um, to the right is George Atzerodt. Um, he was a, a German immigrant. He was a, um, a smuggler. Uh, he, uh, uh, he was recruited um, because he knew the, uh, the area of Southern Maryland uh, quite well. Um, I, I should mention, Lewis Powell had been um, um, in the Confederate Army. He was wounded. Uh, I believe he fought at Petersburg, um, and uh, he uh, then uh, got into the, uh, to the underground. Um, uh, David Harold uh, was a, uh, worked, uh, I believe, as a pharmacist assistant, um, and he, again, he, he, he knew the area. Um, again, that was the reason he was included on it. And, uh, on the bottom right is uh, Mary Surratt, um, who owned the boarding house or the tavern where they would gather to form their plot. Now, one of the things that, that has always drawn me to Abraham Lincoln is uh, the countless stories. Uh, during his life, he would, he would tell jokes. Uh, he would uh, just uh, tell stories um, that really drew people in. And if anyone has seen the movie Lincoln, uh, it was brought up to me before, um, you, you know, you'll, you'll, there are scenes where, um, where he's talking to people and talking about, um, you know, birds. And there was a famous Ethan Allen story, which is my favorite. Um, but another story that uh, he did tell um, um, took place in early April of 1865. Uh, but before that, um, so it's late March of 1865. Um, Lincoln travels down to City Point. Um, Virginia. That's where um, General Grant had his headquarters uh, to meet with with Grant, Sherman, uh, and Admiral Porter to finalize the final campaign of the war. Um, on April second, um, Grant watches his attack uh, along the Petersburg lines, uh, the fifty miles worth of trenches, um, and uh, the following day, R Richmond would would fall. Um, Two days later, um, Lincoln actually toured um, Richmond, which had previously, the day before, had been evacuated and was basically in ruins. Uh, he uh, actually toured, um, toured, he actually sat at Jefferson Davis's desk uh, at the Confederate White House. And it was around this time that he had this dream. Um, and he would tell it to his friend, Ward Hill um, Lehman, and to Mary Lincoln, for what reason, I don't know, because it scared her. And the story goes as this, um, or the dream, I should say. Um, he woke up um, uh, out of bed to hear some sobering downstairs. He goes down the stairs uh, in the White House, and he um, ends up in uh, the East Room, and he sees in front a catafalque uh, with a coffin. And he sees people you know, crying and uh, just uh, a, a, a sad scene. And he walks into the East Room, and there's a soldier at the catafalque. And he asks the soldier, well, who's dead in the White House? And the soldier says, the president. He was killed by an assassin. And that's when Lincoln woke up. It would turn out to be a premise of his own death, uh, which is, well, quite scary. Uh, 
uh, and, and on April 9th, um, a few days later, Lee surrendered uh, at Appomattox. So the following day, uh, Washington, D.C. is um, celebrating the, the victory with fireworks and cannon fire and, and whatnot. Um, people uh, go to the White House. They ask Lincoln to give a speech, and he says, no, I'll, give, I'll speak the next night. But he did ask the band to play uh, Dixie, which was the Confederate, quote, national anthem. Um, so the following day, April 11th, 1865, uh, he gives a speech from the north side of the White House, and in the crowd was John Wilkes Booth and his um, group of conspirators. And uh, during this speech, Lincoln talks about um, giving the ex-slaves, um, you know, soldiers who had, African Americans who had fought in the Union Army, um, the right to vote. And that was the first time that an American president had ever spoken about um, giving African Americans the right to vote. So Booth overhears the speech and he proclaims that uh, I'm going to put him through. This is the last speech he will ever make. Excuse me. And within three days, um, he would fill he would fulfill that commitment um, when he uh, finds out that uh, Lincoln would be attending uh, Ford's Theater. Uh, so Ford's Theater. So this is a picture of how it looked in 18, uh, in around 1865. Um, it was built in 1833. Uh, it was originally um, opened first as uh, as the First Baptist Church. Um, it was abandoned in 1859, and, um, and it was leased to a man named John Ford, who would turn it uh, into a theater. Uh, it would open as a theater uh, on March 19, 1862. Um, but a fire would end up gutting it, um, so it had to be rebuilt, and it reopened the following summer. Um, over the course of the war, Lincoln would attend the theater at least 12 times. And at that time, if you wanted to go to Forest Theater, it would only cost you about, tw about 25 to 75 cents. And at the time that, um, of the assassination, um, a very famous uh, play was, was being done. Um, it was called Our American Cousin. It was a British comedy, um, and it was, it, was, it was about the introduction of a, uh, as it was qu as quoted, a boorish but honest American named Asa, Asa Trenchard, who goes to England and to um, uh, claim the family estate. Um, uh, and in fact, the, the actor who played Asa Trenchard was uh, from Vermont. Uh, and of course, the lead actress um, at that um, in the play was uh, Laura Keene, and that and actually the night that Lincoln would attend the theater, that would be her. That was supposed to be her last performance um, before leaving the stage. Um, so, so April fourteenth, eighteen sixty-five. So Lincoln begins the day, uh, wakes up, has breakfast with his family, then he uh, calls a cabinet meeting to uh, confer with General Grant over what had happened at Appomattox, the, the surrender of Lee's army. Um, Grant, he asks uh, Grant if he, uh, General Grant if he would uh, join him uh, and Mrs. Lincoln uh, at Ford's Theater that night. But Grant uh, politely declines. And the reason he declined was because uh, he, Mrs. Grant did not like Mary Lincoln. Uh, they, uh, in fact, a lot of people did not like Mary Lincoln at that time. So. Um, so, uh, so, so Grant um, did not go to the theater. He would actually um, go back to New Jersey. He would actually go to New Jersey to meet, uh, to be with uh, his children. Um, so that's why he did not go to Fort Seether that night. Uh, so during the day, um, Booth uh, goes to Fort Theater, picks up his mail, and that's when he discovers that um, that the president would be attending the theater that night. Um, so he comes up with this new plan, uh, meets with his conspirators, and the plot is this. He will go to Forest Theater that night, uh, and he will shoot Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Lewis Powell would uh, go to the home of William Seward and assassinate him, and George Atzerodt would go to uh, the Kirkwood Hotel. Uh, the vice president at that time did not have a residence of his own, uh, and would shoot Andrew Johnson. Um, Booth would write out a confession um, to be published in the National, uh, in the National Intelligentsia newspaper, um, which did not get published because the man he gave it to burned it when he opened it up and discovered what was in it. Um, 
he goes to, uh, to the nearby stable to rent a horse. And he also, uh, during the day, went to the uh, Surat Tavern to, um, to get uh, guns and other supplies because he knew he would need them that night. So during the day uh, after the cabinet meeting, um, Abraham and Mary Lincoln would go on a carriage ride uh, around Washington. They talked about the past. They talked about the death of their son, Willie. Uh, he had died uh, early in the war uh, and uh, it devastated them. Um, Mary Lincoln never, well, she sort of recovered from it, um, but for a brief time. Uh, they talked about uh, the future. They wanted to uh, go out west. They wanted to go to Europe. They wanted, he, president wanted to see um, the Holy Land. Um, and Mary Lincoln would describe him as being very cheerful and in a silly mood um, and saying that, the war, that he felt the war was at an end. Um, so by the time uh, they would go to the theater that night, just about everyone that he had invited had declined to go with him. Um, but as, as fate would have it, um, he did, uh, he, um, two people did accept the invitation. Uh, Clara Harris, who was the daughter of, a, of a, a senator from New York, and her husband, Major Henry Rathbone. Um, they would arrive late uh, the night of April 14, 1865. Um, they arrived at Ford's Theater about 8.30 that evening. And uh, by then the play had already begun. And as they walked in, um, the play stopped, everyone rose, and the band sang Hail to the Chief. Um, and they go into the box, they take their seats, and they begin to watch um, the play. Now, the box um, was supposed to be guarded by, um, by policeman John Parker. Um, at that time, there was no Secret Service. Um, again, there was no FBI. There was no secu real security detail. Um, there had been some uh, uh, policemen from the Washington police that had been assigned to uh, secure the president. Um, but uh, Lincoln did not like um, to be sur surrounded by guards. That just was not his style. Um, so at, at some point during the, uh, after they get there, um, Mr. Parker uh, gets up, goes to the tavern. Uh, um, meanwhile, John Wilkes Booth would arrive um, sometime around nine o'clock. Um, and uh, he also um, will go to the tavern. Um, and before that, he um, would ask um, the stage man um, named Ed Edmund Spangler to hold his horse uh, while he went in. Uh, he ended up going to the tavern. And, and a reported story, and it's not verified if this in fact happened, um, was that when Booth was in the tavern, uh, the owner of the, of the tavern has said to him, you know, Booth, you're a good actor, but you're, you're not as good as, as your father was. And Booth looks up to him and says, well, sir, when I leave the stage, I'll be the most talked about man in America and walks away. Now, whether or not that happened, uh, we'll never know. Um, but it is an interesting uh, story. So while Booth is getting ready to carry out his evil deed at Forest Theater, uh, eight blocks away at the home of William Seward. Um, I, and I, I want to just mention, um, because Lincoln and Seward had been rivals in 1860. But as the war would progress, um, they would actually become very close friends. Um, this after Lincoln had to put him in his place early in the war, um, when Seward basically went around him and was giving hints to the Confederates that, you know, we're going to surrender Fort Sumter and, you know, I'm, you know you're going to deal with me. Um, Lincoln basically told him, I'm the president, you're the Secretary of State, I'm the one who makes policy, so back off, which he did. So by this time, they, they, they were very close. Um, now, on, uh, just a couple days before this happened, um, Seward and his son um, were in a carriage accident. Um, Seward's jaw and his arm were broke. Uh, so he was essentially in bed. He could not move, could not talk. Um, so on the night of April 14th, uh, around 10, 10 o'clock, Lewis Powell arrives at the home of Secretary Seward, uh, pretending to be uh, from Seward's doctor, Dr. Verdi, saying that he had medicine for, for, the, for the secretary. 
Um, he's greeted by, um, by the house servant um, named William. He was an African-American serv uh, house servant. Um, he's there saying, you know, I'm here, uh, I have medicine for, for Mr. Seward. Um, and at first the, the house servant says, well, you can't come in, but give it to me, I'll give it to him. He's like, and his answer was, no, I, I have to give it to him personally. So he pushes, pushes him by. Um, goes up the stairs and runs a, into um, his, uh, Seward's son, Frederick, who was the assistant secretary of state. Um, so uh, he says, you know, you can't come in. Um, my father's sleeping. Um, but Powell says, you know, I, I'm, I'm sent by the doctor. I have to give it to him personally. Um, but Seward again says, you know, get out of here. Um, you know, you can't come in. So at this point, uh, Powell is, um, they're at the top of the stairs. Uh, he starts to turn away. Then all of a sudden he takes out a revolver. And he tries to shoot Frederick Seward. The problem was the gun misfired. He tried it a second time, misfired again. So he then takes the gun and starts to bludgeon um, Frederick Seward. Hits him several times in the, in the head um, and actually fractured his skull. So he's unconscious, he's bleeding everywhere, and then, uh, and actually broke the gun. So no longer useful. Uh, Powell takes out a large bowie knife, bursts in to Seward's office, um, not office, uh, bedroom. He jumps on the bed and starts to stab him in the face and neck. And that is a uh, drawn image of the uh, attack. Uh, Seward's uh, uh, nurse, um, his name was George Robinson, and Seward's other son, Augustus, uh, they struggle with, with, um, with Powell. They try to get him away, um, but Powell stabs them both. And then as, um, and, and while this is going on, um, uh, Seward's daughter Fanny is screaming, you know, like, you know, don't, you know, don't kill, you know, don't murder my father. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a chaotic situation. Um, and before Powell uh, finally leaves the house, he stabs um, a clerk from the State Department named Emmerich uh, Hansel uh, in, the ba uh, in the back, and he's proclaiming, I'm mad, I am mad, and he, st and he storms out of the house. So by the time uh, it's over with, he's, in, he's seriously injured five people. Um, his daughter, Fanny, would li who witnessed it um, and, and would later write this, um, blood, blood, my thoughts seemed drenched in it. I seemed to breathe its sickening odor. Um, and I have a picture uh, later on I'll show you of, of, of uh, Secretary Seward after the attack. So while Powell is attacking the Secretary of State over at Ford's Theater, it's 10.15 uh, in the evening, and it's during the third act of Our American Cousin that Booth um, wa walks in quietly, and he fires a single bullet uh, into the back of the president's head uh, behind his left ear. Um, so. The, the shot goes off. Um, Major Rathbone uh, gets up, tries to uh, wrestle with, with Booth, but he has a knife, stabs uh, Major Rathbone in the arm, and then Booth jumps off uh, the stage, uh, breaking his uh, left leg, not right leg, that's an error up there, and he shouts in front of the crowd, Six Semper Tyrannis, thus always to tyrants, the state motto of Virginia. Um, Later on, some of the witnesses would give testimony saying that he had said other things. Um, it's not entirely accurate um, if that in fact happened. Uh, so Booth um, runs out, he escapes from Ford Theater, gets on his horse, and he uh, escapes from Washington and begins a what would become a 12-day manhunt. Uh, so Lincoln is unconscious um, after being shot. And the first doctor to arrive on the scene was, was a 23-year-old army surgeon um, named Dr. Charles Leal. Uh, he examines uh, the president and within minutes discovers the bullet hole in the back of his head and um, basically says this is a mortal wound. 
Um, following that, uh, they move um, Lincoln out of Ford's Theater. Um, there's, they were thinking of taking him back to the White House, um, but Dr. Leo wanted to get him to a, a, to a comfortable place um, right away. Um, there was even thought, well, let's take him to the saloon, to the tavern, and uh, right where John Wilkes Booth had just been. Um, the owner said, um, absolutely not. Um, it should not be said that the President of the United States died in a saloon. Uh, so they're looking for a place to take um, the President, and, um, and all of a sudden a gentleman shouts out, bring him here. So they take him across the street to, the, to a boarding house owned by a man named William Peterson. Um, the death watch, it would last about nine hours. And Dr. Leo actually stayed with Lincoln the entire time. He held, uh, held his hand, as he would later say, to let him in his blindness know that he had a friend. Um, so Secretary of War Edwin Stanton uh, arrived, took command of the situation. He orders Washington on, uh, on lockdown, essentially. Um, and, uh, and, and then begins the pursuit for the assassins. Mary Lincoln, who was, who was right next to Lincoln when this happened, she descends into, into hysteria. She's crying. It's, uh, uh, it's just, it's, 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 a, it's a really uh, sad uh, situation. Um, before she collapsed about seven o'clock, um, just her grief just overwhelmed her. And uh, Secretary Stanton ordered her out of the room don't, do not let her back in. Uh, finally, at about 7.22, the following morning of April 15th, 1865, Abraham Lincoln drew his final breath. And Dr. Leo said simply, he is gone. And Secretary of War Stanton would say, now he belongs to the ages. So the third part of this uh, three-prong attack um, involved George Atzerodt, um, who was assigned to assassinate Vice President Andrew Johnson. Uh, he actually rented a room at the Kirkwood Hotel, which is where Johnson stayed, was staying. Um, but instead of carrying through with the attack, uh, George Atzerodt decided to get drunk instead, uh, did not go through with the attack, um, and uh, the Vice President um, survived. Um, when he learned of what had happened to the president, he said, they shall suffer for this, they shall suffer for this. Uh, the following day, April 15th, roughly a little after 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, he was sworn in as the 17th president of the United States. And he would uh, serve out the rest of his term. Uh, Lincoln's autopsy. Uh, I, have, I was unsure if I wanted to include this in, in the presentation tonight, but I, at the end I felt it was important to include this. Um, so after Lincoln uh, had, had passed away, um, Secretary of War Stanton, uh, he had uh, immediately ordered the room locked and guarded. No one gets in. Um, about, an, about an hour later, um, Lincoln's body was wrapped up in an American flag, was placed in a plain pine coffin, and taken back to the White House for the autopsy. Uh, at the autopsy, there were uh, two surgeons and seven other witnesses, including the Lincoln family physician. And one of the, the surgeons, Dr. Edward Curtis, uh, wrote an account about the auto autopsy, and I wanted to read it to you. He said, we proceeded to remove the entire brain, when as I was lifting the ladder from the cavity of the skull, suddenly the bullet dropped out through my fingers and fell, breaking the silence of the room with its clatter. The cause of such mighty changes in the world's history as we may perhaps never realize. Uh, when the autopsy was finished, the president's body was embalmed and prepared for the funeral. Uh, so news of the assassination spread very, very fast um, and Shock and sadness replaced the celebration uh, of the news of Lee's surrender. Um, the, our local paper, the Springfield Republican, uh, on April 15th, uh, and I should have dated it, but I didn't, um, said, and I quote, people could hardly believe the news, and as they gradually realized it was true, expressions of sorrow were on every tongue. 
And even many in the South mourned the death of the president, though there were some who didn't quite share uh, that mood of mourning. Among those was um, Emma LeConte, uh, LeConte, I believe is how you pronounce her name. She was the daughter of a college professor in South Carolina. Again, South Carolina, the hotbed of secession. And she wrote uh, a couple days after uh, the assassination, she said, hurrah, old Abe, Abe Lincoln has been assassinated. It may be abstractly wrong to be so jubilant, but I just can't help it. Um, I, can, I can probably assure you that uh, she was in a small minority um, who felt this way about um, the president's death. So Abraham Lincoln's a funeral. Um, so from April 17th uh, to the 18th, um, again, just as Lincoln had envisioned in his dream, uh, he would lie in state in the East Room of the White House. Uh, on April 19th, uh, Lincoln's funeral was held, um, again, in the East Room of the White House. Uh, his body would then be taken up to the Capitol, to the Rotunda, where it would lie in state until April 21st. And it was on April 21st that his body, along with the body of his son Willie, who again died in uh, 1862, um, was put on a, a specially fit funeral train, which is up there on, on the right. Now, the thing about that train is, um, the president was actually supposed to see that train uh, the day he died. Um, it was all ready for him. He was supposed to go and, and take a look at it, but he never made it. So they had to re, re, uh, redo it, and it was, it was laid out um, for the funeral um, to begin the over 1,600-mile journey back to Springfield, um, Illinois. Um, so along the journey, it would go to 14 cities. Uh, up to a million people attended the funeral in New York City and Buffalo. Over, um, over 100,000 people would attend. Uh, including ex-president Millard Fillmore and future president Grover Cleveland. Uh, this picture was taken uh, when he, uh, when it was going through uh, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, Mary Lincoln did not uh, go attend the funeral. She did not go with the procession. She stayed um, in her bedroom in the White House. She would stay there for up to 40 days um, before leaving. Um, so she did not uh, attend. Um, on May 3rd, uh, Lincoln would arrive back in Springfield. Um, the body was taken to the uh, Illinois House, uh, the same place where he gave um, his House Divided speech a few years earlier, and over uh, 75,000 would attend um, and pay their respects to the fallen president. And the following day, May 4th, um, Lincoln is, quote, laid to rest um, at Oak Ridge Cemetery. And the reason I say um, I do it like this is because um, in 1876, there was actually an attempt to steal his body. Uh, it did not succeed, um, uh, but unfortunately, he did not um, lay. You know, he did not rest in peace um, as he sh as he should have. Um, so, so for so the manhunt for for Booth, um, this would last up to 12 days, um, and it the whole country was looking was just in shock and determined that Booth and his conspirators would be found and punished. So um, after leaving uh, Ford's Theater, uh, about 11 o'clock that, that night, uh, Booth would cross the Navy Yard Bridge into Southern Maryland. Um, now, the bridge was supposed to be closed by military order, but the guard let him by uh, anyway, which he should not have done. Um, about 11.15, um, Booth would meet with David Harold. Now, Harold again was he was at the house with with Lewis Powell, uh, at the Seward house. But when he heard the screams, uh, you know, murder, murder, you know, he got he 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 got scared and he took off, uh, left Lewis Powell by himself. Powell did not know Washington. He uh, and that would come back to haunt him a few days later. Um, so Harold uh, flees and would meet up with Booth. Um, in, uh, at, at, um, at, at a spot called Sopras Hill, um, just over the, the border into Maryland. Um, so early on April 15th, about 12 a.m., Booth and Harold again stop at the Seward Tavern to pick up the guns and supplies that Booth had asked for a few hours earlier. Um, 4 a.m., they arrive at the house of Dr. Samuel Mudd. Samuel Mudd was a Confederate sympathizer. Um, and he would, he would uh, work on Booth's um, broken left leg. Uh, 
and they would spend about a day there. Um, the following day, April 16th, um, Booth and Harold, uh, they would hire a local guide, uh, and they would reach the home of, uh, of a man named Samuel Cox. He was uh, the local leader of the Confederate underground movement. So again, that was the, the, the hotbed of, of Southern activity in that part of Maryland. Um, Cox then gets them in touch with his brother-in-law named Thomas Jones. He was a Confederate smuggler. Uh, and his job was to help them get across the Potomac River into Virginia. Um, so for about five days after that, uh, Booth and Harold um, are hiding uh, in a local area called the Zakiah Swamp. Um, and it's at this point where um, Booth um, begins to get, um, you know, uh, through newspapers, accounts of what had happened with Secretary Seward and the reaction um, from what they had done. Um, and I'll get to that uh, in, in a moment. Um, while this was going on, um, the, uh, the, uh, the War Department had ordered uh, the Union Cavalry, um, the 16th New York was one of those uh, regiments, and the local police um, to go and get the assassins. So they're on, um, on the hunt for Booth and Harold. And on April 21st, Booth and Harold make their first attempt to cross the Potomac River. The problem was the current and the fact that the river was being uh, patrolled by, by naval ships. Um, and so it's on April 21st, April 22nd, we're not sure exactly what day, that Booth would write in his journal, quote, and yet I, for striking down a greater tyrant uh, than they ever knew, and looked upon as a common cutthroat. Um, so as Booth is reading these newspapers brought to him by Thomas Jones, um, he's realizing that, well, the, you know, people in the South are not reacting uh, to what he had done as he had thought, um, you know, celebrating, and uh, it just, that just did not happen. Um, and Booth was beginning to realize it by this point. The following day, April 22nd, uh, on the second attempt, uh, Booth and Harold successfully crossed the Potomac River into Virginia. So they are now on the Virginia side. Um, and along, and so for the next couple days, um, as they're progressing through Virginia, um, they go from one house to another and they're turned away. Um, and this is more proof to Booth that, that um, the reaction to what he had done was not what he had expected. Uh, so on April 24th, uh, about midday, uh, they arrive in the town of Port Conway, Virginia, and they, meet, and they encounter three ex-Confederate soldiers. Uh, one of the three was, was an 18-year-old named Willie Jett, um, and he takes them to a farm, a house owned by a local man named Richard Garrett, uh, and Garrett takes them into his home. Now, um, Garrett had no idea who they were. Uh, Booth did not tell them. Um, so, uh, so Booth um, was welcomed in. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, the um, the elements of the of the Union Cavalry and, and the and the detectives that were um, looking for Booth were getting tips, getting information that they're nearby. So they're getting close. Uh, so about 2 a.m. on April 26th. Uh, federal troops, again, the cavalry that I mentioned, arrived at the Garrett farm after being tipped off by Willie Jett. Of, of, of all people, the one that had sent Booth to the Garrett farm, he tipped off the Union troops that this is where he was. Um, so they arrive at the Garrett farm, um, and by this point, Rich, uh, Richard Garrett is already getting suspicious that something is not right. So he actually kicked them out of his house into their tobacco farm. So by the time uh, the Union troops get there, um, they have the place surrounded. Um, Booth, um, well, Harold uh, immediately surrenders, but Booth says, um, I will not be taken alive. So the troops set fire to the barn where Booth, he's holding out on his crutches. He's only got one good leg. Um, and, uh, and then all of a sudden, a shot is fired. And, uh, and he was shot through the neck, so he fell and was instantly paralyzed from the neck down. Uh, he was shot by, by uh, a man named uh, um, Boston Corbett. He, Corbett. He, had been, he was a sergeant 
um, with the uh, with with uh, with those uh, those troops. Um, so the bullet severed his spinal cord. He was paralyzed. Um, so they dragged Booth out of the barn, and he begins. You know, he's already dying. He's saying, uh, you know, tell my mother I died for my country. Um, and as he's laying there dying, um, he asks one of the soldiers to lift up his arms to see his hands. And, and the only thing he says was, useless, useless. And just after sunrise on April 26th, he died. Um, so now this is, uh, again, I, I'm hoping I would use the, the, the pointer. Um, this is a visual of the area. So as you can see, up top is Washington. Uh, and, and so the arrow is pointing uh, to where um, the direction that they would go um, over the course of the 12 days. And the Garrett Farm is down there on the, the left, um, not too far away from, um, from Fredericksburg. Um, so this is sort of a visual idea of the area where they would be uh, um, where they would be traveling over the 12 days. Uh, so what happens to, uh, to everyone else that was involved um, after Booth dies? Um, well, before that happened, um, on April 17th, so just three days after um, Powell attacks uh, Secretary of State William Seward, um, he is arrested. He actually um, appears at uh, Mary Surratt's uh, tavern. Um, when he gets there, um, there's Federal troops are already there. She's being questioned, and um, they ask they ask her, "Do you know who this man is?" And uh, she says, "No." Well, in fact, she did know who he was, and uh, he tried getting out of it, but uh, they did not fall for it. So he was arrested, um, as along with uh, Mary Surratt. Uh, April twentieth, um, George Atzerat, again who did not uh, assassinate the vice president. Again, he got drunk uh, and walked out. Um, he was arrested uh, at his cousin's house in uh, Germantown, Maryland, again, outside of Washington. Um, the, uh, um, let's see. So on May 1st, um, President Johnson, he's only been in office for, for a couple weeks, um, by executive order establishes a military commission to try the conspirators. And I should also mention, uh, also, about a, uh, dozens of people were, were arrested over, this, over the course of these few weeks. Um, and, and, and by the time this trial began, it was narrowed down um, to the following. Lewis Powell, um, David Harold, George Atzerat, um, Mary Surratt, um, and, other, and, and others involved in, in the original plot to kidnap the president uh, would stand trial, including Michael O'Loughlin, Samuel Arnold, Arnold uh, Edmund Spangler, who again uh, worked at Forest Theater, um, as well as Dr. Uh, Dr. Mudd. Uh, the commission was made up of nine uh, members. They were all um, generals. Um, and the prosecution was led by uh, Judge Advocate General uh, Joseph Halt. Uh, the trial began on May 10, 1865. Um, upwards of 365, 366 witnesses um, would give testimony. The defendants were not allowed to testify on their own behalf. Uh, and if anyone has seen the movie The Conspirator, um, a very good film, um, uh, if you haven't, uh, I, I encourage you to watch it. It's, uh, it's a very good depiction of, uh, of the trial um, surrounding Mary Surratt. Um, and I'll speak about that in a, in a minute. Uh, so the trial would last about, uh, about six, seven weeks, um, eight weeks. Um, so at the end of June 1865, uh, the, uh, the, um, the military tribunal, um, the commission reaches its verdict. Um, and it goes as following. Uh, Edmund Spangler would be sentenced to six years in prison. Life in prison um, without parole um, would be um, Samuel Arnold, Michael O'Loughlin, and Dr. Mudd. Now, Dr. Mudd and uh, Spangler would be pardoned by President Johnson in February of 1869. Um, Michael O'Loughlin actually died in prison, so he did not live to get a pardon. Um, and the and for the four, uh, unfor uh, well, unfortunately for those four, uh, George Atzerat, Lewis Powell, David Harold, and Mary Surratt, they received the sentence of death by hanging. Um, 
So on July 7th, uh, 1865, the execution, it's carried out at the old Arsenal Penitentiary in Washington. And Lewis Powell's last words um, before uh, he went down um, were, quote, Mr. Surratt is innocent. And there's been a lot of controversy ever since um, the assassination as to Mary Surratt's um, involvement. Um, you know, was she involved with the kidnapping plot? Was she directly involved with the assassination? Um, I mean, we'll never know exactly, um, but, she, and she, but she was the first woman to be executed by the United States government. Um, now, like the Kennedy assassination a century later, there are numerous conspiracy, conspiracy theories about the Lincoln assassination. Um, most of them have, if not all of them, have been debunked. Uh, so some theories include um, involvement by Jefferson Davis uh, and other Confederate officials. Now, we know that Booth uh, was in Canada, in, in Montreal. Um, that was the centerpiece, or the center point of Confederate activity in, in Canada at that time. Uh, we know he was there in August of 1864, and he met with um, some Confederate officials, but we don't, there isn't enough evidence to say that they were, that they had some involvement with the original plot to kidnap Lincoln, or if they authorized it. There just isn't enough to say for sure that that happened. Um, so other theories, um, one claim uh, was that Booth uh, did not die at the Garrett farm. Um, and possible other uh, involvements by uh, Edwin Stanton uh, and the new president, Andrew Johnson. Uh, uh, but again, most, if not all of these have been um, thrown out. Um, so what happens after, um, after the dust settles and, um, and the country begins to slowly move on? Um, well, here's a quote from the New York Times uh, two days after the president's death. Quote, in President, in President Johnson, moreover, the country has a man of courage, of sound judgment, and of a patriotism which has stood the tests of the most terrible trials. His sympathies are with the people, and all his action will be for their good. Well, as fate would have it, that is not how Andrew Johnson would turn out. Um, he today is, uh, he would serve out uh, the rest of Lincoln's term until March of 1869. Um, and he is today ranked as one of our worst presidents in history. And if you were to ask me, I would say uh, the, the worst president in, in history. Um, so during his term, um, Johnson uh, would, would really go to war with, uh, with Congress, with the uh, radical uh, Republicans uh, in Congress um, over, the, uh, over who would control uh, Reconstruction. Um, before Lincoln's assassination, um, that battle was already beginning to brew, um, but had Lincoln lived, it's very likely that it wouldn't have been as severe as it would be um, with Andrew Johnson. And now, uh, at the time, now I said a few minutes ago um, when Lincoln was nominated um, for re-election that Johnson was put on the ticket for national unity. Well the, well, the issue was Johnson was not a Republican, he was a Democrat, and he was from the South. So again, had they done their job and vetted uh, Andrew Johnson, uh, they, may have, um, they may have discovered that he would, over time, identify with um, Southern Democrats who wanted to reestablish white supremacy in the defeated Confederacy. Um, and over time, Johnson would, would veto several um, pieces of legislation trying to enhance civil rights. Um, and in 1868, um, by one vote, by one vote, Andrew Johnson survived the first attempt at impeachment. Um, and I found this cartoon of Andrew Johnson, and uh, uh, I think it's appropriate um, for the occasion. Uh, life after eight, April of 1865. So as I said um, a short time ago, uh, William Seward, his son Frederick, uh, Augustus, uh, the nurse, and the clerk from the State Department, they all survived their wounds. As horrific a scene as Lewis Powell caused, no one died that night. Um, he would continue on as Secretary of State until um, 1869. Um, he would uh, um, 
be responsible for the purchase of Alaska. He would sign the treaty with the Russians. And the picture up on the right is, is of Seward after the attack. And as you can see um, on his, his neck, uh, how it loops down. That is from uh, the impact of uh, the blade uh, of the knife when Lewis Powell uh, attacked, um, attacked him. Um, again, he had been injured, so his, so his neck was up. So as Seward, uh, as, I'm sorry, as Powell was attacking um, him, he would just slash his cheek. He didn't get any of the major vein, uh, arteries, so he, he was very lucky to survive um, that attack. Um, Mary Lincoln, she never really recovered from the murder of her husband, as well as the death of her son a few years earlier. Um, in 1875, she was actually declared insane. She actually was put, in, uh, put away into a mental institution for about uh, three to six months um, by her son, Robert Todd, after she tried jumping out of a window. Uh, she, would, uh, she would pass away uh, in 1882 in Springfield, uh, Illinois. Uh, and um, his son, Robert, as I said, he was the only son who would survive to adulthood. He would become Secretary of War under President James Garfield. And he was actually uh, at Union Station uh, where President Garfield was um, shot himself uh, in 1881. And he was again at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo in 1901 when President McKinley was shot. So he unfortunately was uh, at the site of two more presidential assassinations um, over the next uh, 36 years. So as we look back 150 years later, what is President Lincoln's legacy? Um, I was trying to answer this question myself over the last few days. And uh, last night as uh, Forest Theater was doing its commemoration, um, and I'm, for, for full disclosure, I'm a big Twitter fan. And I sent out a tweet, and I just boarded out the following. I said, um, Lincoln's legacy without question has to be his love for the Union and his devotion to a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Um, and I, I really believe that. And having done this enough research on Lincoln, um, I really believe he left us um, a, 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 better, a better country than, it, than when he um, found it. That doesn't mean we don't have um, you know, disagreements, but um, at least we can agree more than, you know, than disagree, and certainly um, not at the point of a, of a gun. So, um, and, and I mean, everyone else has their own opinions about his legacy, but, but I think for this occasion, I think without question, it's, it was his love um, for the Union and what he saw uh, for the United States going forward, um, because out of, out of the wake of the Civil War, the United States would eventually become a world power, and we never really turned back from that. So um, we owe uh, our country's survival to um, his, 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 uh, his sacrifice. Uh, he's, he was uh, referred to uh, or called after his death as the last casualty of the Civil War. Uh, so finally, um, I would just like to again thank the Palmer, the Historical Center, uh, for allowing me to present to you tonight. And again, we're very fortunate to have a facility such as this to have events like this. And uh, I hope to be back uh, at a later date. I was already talking to Mr. Havlis about some, about a possibility next uh, year. So we'll see. Uh, it's not uh, we're uh, we're a little ways off. Um, also, Forge Theater. Um, you know, I, I have to give them um, a mention for their support and assistance. Um, during my research. Uh, I, I actually reached out to them again on Twitter and when I told them I was doing this they were very excited and they wished me well and they gave me um, some good sources uh, to, um, to use and I'm very grateful to the people at Force Theater. They've done a great, uh, I really appreciate their support. And finally to my friends, in particular my friend Dwight over here uh, who's been with me last couple weeks and putting up with uh, with with uh, with me uh, throughout this whole process, so thank you for for, th for that. Um, to my family for their continuous support, and finally to you. And I really appreciate you coming here tonight uh, on this the, the 150th anniversary of the death of President Abraham Lincoln. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
You certainly may. Okay, first I just have a comment. Like you said, I think that um, Lincoln did a great service to our country because he saw that you can't have a country that's divided. That's right. And at that time, there was the union and the confederate, well, there was the division about slavery. Oh, yeah. And he just knew that you can't stand as a country if we're not together. Yeah. So I think that is one of his biggest things. Yeah. And my other, but my question was, you said that um, at the theater, he didn't want the policeman around him. Mm -hmm. Now, there's been research that stated he suffered from melancholy at times. Yes. Yeah. Do you think that he had a death wish? That maybe he, because he had death threats. He yeah. knew people were trying to kill him. And he tells the policeman, don't stand next to me. Yeah. I mean, was there anything in your research about that? <sighs> did, did he have a, a death Yeah, but was he like, why was, it, why was he so cavalier about not having protection? Uh, well, he, he, he wanted to be accessible to, uh, to, to the people. He and, wanted to look like that. Right, okay. and, exactly. And, um, and you mentioned the melancholy. Um, uh, and the, re the research um, that's been done in the last couple of years um, has connected that to the reason why he initially broke off his engagement to marry. Yeah, to marry. the first time. The first time. And yeah. then they would eventually uh, marry um, in 1842. Um, I would say he just wanted to be accessible to the people. He didn't want to be secluded. He didn't want, as I said, he didn't, he didn't want um, all these guards protecting him. Yeah, you said it wasn't his style. Yeah, it wasn't his style. Okay. And, um, and you know, he people were warning him, you know, Mr. President, you have to take this seriously. Um, and he, you know, he, uh, there are countless quotes of him referring to the possibility of, of, of being assassinated. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, so and he, he might have known it could come yeah, someday. Yeah, uh, I, I think, I I personally, and, and having, having read enough about Lincoln, um, I think I think he, he was definitely well aware that it could happen, and mm -hmm. and his his think his thinking was there's nothing I can do to stop it. So if it's gonna happen, it's, it's, yeah, it's gonna happen. But I it's want to remain accessible to people. That, I don't want to look was, like I have all these. Exactly, and okay. it ended up costing him his life. Right. Um, on April 14, 1865. So, okay. Yeah, that's a good question. I had a feeling I might get a question about that <laughs> or something. <laughs> Well, yeah, why do you say go away, policeman? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, he he, he loved being uh, accessible to uh, to the American people, and uh, you know it's so easy. You know, anyone. I was listening uh, last night to the to the coverage from Forest Theater, and one of the historians who wrote a book about the manhunt, uh, and he was absolutely right. He said, it, it, if 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 a Confederate, um, you know, um, what's the word? Not spy, but. Um, I can't think of one, but anyway, if, if someone wanted to just walk into the White House and stab him or shoot him, it would have been easy because the White House is not like it. It wasn't like today where it's you now guarded and, 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 and with, with with these fences and you know, it was nothing like that back then. Um, it, it was very easy. Someone could have just gotten into, into the White House and killed him at any time, at any time yeah. and that never happened. Uh -huh. um, but no, he, he wanted to be as, as accessible to the people as possible. Answer the question. Yes, sir. What was the reasoning of bringing in uh, the secretary and the vice president in the plot? To, and I don't know why I didn't mention this, um, the, 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 the plan was um, to basically decapitate the government. So in Booth's twisted mind, if, 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 if I can knock out the president, the vice president, the secretary of state, the union government will be in chaos. And, and maybe that would give uh, Lee and, uh, and uh, the remaining Confederates that were still out there one more chance to fight back. But I, I mean, but, but by that time, I mean, Lee had already surrendered. Um, General Johnston, um, who was fighting Sherman, um, was within days of surrendering. So there was no realistic chance that if that had happened, that the South would have risen. Because by then, the North had over a million, or about a million men in arms. The South had less than 100,000. So there was no way that, okay, if, if I can knock off the government, 
thrown into chaos, the South will have one more chance. So that was the premise of, um, of the, uh, the three-pronged attack. Um, and, it didn't, and it didn't happen. So, yeah. Any more? Is there anything else? Or? Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very, very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have an interesting tidbit, though, that I, I just realized I was sitting here, because you mentioned about the Ford Theater mm -hmm. starting out as a Baptist church. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't want any of you to be afraid of going to bed tonight. <laughs> no, but uh, this was originally built as a Baptist church. And this yeah, was back in the mid-1850s. And then it became the Union Evangelical Church in the 1940s. And then we converted it. But we're not a theater of <laughs> sort. But, but we might be having a production here. So hopefully there's no premonition. But thank you so much. Great presentation. Thank you very, thank you very much. much. Thank you very much. Thank you.